Hello, Emmy watchers. Uh, Gold Derby editor here, Daniel Montgomery here, uh, with uh, our contributor, uh, writer, and uh, genius uh, creative arts Emmy predictor, Cordell Martin, um, who was uh, the highest scoring user predicting the creative arts Emmys over the weekend. Um, he had 72% correct. He was the only person with 72 correct. This wasn't some silly tiebreaker with, you know, 10, 10 people got 72 correct and it was a tiebreaker based on the points. No, he stood alone. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Cordell, um, I'm afraid you're fired for embarrassing all of us. Um, that's, it's just not cool. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, we'll get into a couple of specific categories, um, and then talk about some of the categories coming up on Monday's telecast. Uh, what was the prediction you are proudest of? Because I saw a lot that you got right to that I would be very proud of. <laughs> I think my proudest prediction was. Um, predicting Cat Williams for Outstanding Guest Actor in a comedy series for Atlanta. Um, once the nominees were announced and he was actually nominated, uh, that was half the battle for him. So once I knew if he can get the nomination, I think he has a strong shot at winning. And once he's nominated, I'm happy. I was right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I was just talking to you before we started recording about how I sort of had a feeling there could be something there too. I ranked him second, but I don't get credit for being almost right. Um, you know, it did feel a lot like, uh, like I remember when Melissa Leo won for Louis, you know, that kind of win that seems a little bit out of the ordinary, but it's this really big, broad, standout, one-off performance that can sometimes appeal to voters more than kind of the SNL hosts, which, yeah. you know, especially when there are a lot of SNL hosts, a lot of times it's just like they see a lot of those and they just want to pick something else, um, which ended up happening, which I, I might think of in the future next time there are uh, so many SNL hosts. Although you did get Tiffany Haddish right as well. They weren't sick of SNL in that category. They did vote for her there. Uh, uh, and, and she was really the front runner there. What, what made you go with an actual front runner instead of going on a crazy limb there? Yeah, with that category in particular, um, to your point, I just felt that she had the biggest buzz out of the nominees going in. Um, you know, she's been all over the place since her breakout in Girls Trip. And, you know, I just felt that the Emmy holders were going to embrace her. Um, and that was one of the few instances where I was like, okay, front runner, most buzz about nominee, slam dunk in terms of predicting her. And, uh, and then you've got uh, Ron Cephas Jones, who you also predicted would win. And I also <laughs> had in second place. Uh, so I was almost right. Um, and that one, I, I totally, when it happened, I, I, I felt silly because I predicted Samira Wiley would win. Um, and Ron Cephas Jones, I should have been predicting for the exact same reason. She you know, nominated for supporting last year. So we know how much they love them. Uh, didn't win then. So this was a perfect chance to kind of play catch up with them. Yep. Um, you know, so so I don't know why I didn't apply the same logic to Ron Cephas Jones that I applied to to Samira Wiley. Um, uh, so talk a little bit about making that prediction. Yeah, actually, I did the opposite. I um, had Samira Wiley second and didn't go with my gut, to your point, with the whole makeup award and then her presenting the nominees. Like, I should have just stuck to my guns on that, but I was being biased in that particular category, selecting Viola Davis. But... <laughs> With Ron Cephas Jones, uh, to your point, um, you know, it was just a makeup award from last year. You know, I think probably was the runner up in that category. Um, and then also with that category, they like to honor a lot of characters that are in actors, like uh, Reggie Patton, for example. Glenn Turman, also. Exactly, exactly. So I just felt that, you know, this was their opportunity to uh, give him. Uh, the Emmy win um, for the show, um, also depending on future seasons and how much Emmy love they're going to get. So I figured this was the best time for them to get them out of the way, so to speak, you know, um, depending on the future Emmy love for this event. Uh, and then um, among your other uh, best predictions, I would say, uh, is Strong Island, which is not a category a lot of us were like paying too close attention to. It's one of like 10 nonfiction uh, categories that the Emmys, um, we all, a lot of us looked at Jane and thought, okay, you know, it didn't get the Oscar nomination. So there was kind of a lot of wanting to make up for it there. Uh, we thought would happen. It was 
it might have been the most widely seen or at least the most widely uh, uh, promoted of, of the uh, uh, documentaries nominated for exceptional merit in documentary filmmaking. Um, but it went to Strong Island and I was thrilled it went to Strong Island. I loved Strong Island. I thought like, oh, maybe he could have a shot, but I felt like, oh, Jane is nominated everywhere else. He'll go with Jane. Um, you know, what, what made you think Strong Island had a shot? Yeah, um, and another thing, another way that I predict the winners is also just looking at the cultural significance of certain nominees and the Creative Arts Emmys. They do a great job in honoring marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, you have shows like Born This Way, Queer Eye, um, well, Drag Race, just for example, as you know, diverse group of children that we honor. Uh, so I figured with the subject matter of uh, Long Island and then also the filmmaker um, who was uh, actually the first openly gender uh, man to be nominated for um, an Oscar in the documentary category. I felt like, okay, I think that's going to be the winner. And um, left to my guns, I was right. <laughs> And I'm very happy to be wrong on that one. Strong yeah. Island, I thought, was an extraordinary documentary. And everyone sh watching this should pause, watch it, then come back and watch the rest of this video uh, immediately. Um, but then make sure to come back to watch this video, because now we're going to talk about the Emmys for the rest of the categories, the last 26 categories that will be handed out on Monday night, September 17th. And you know, you know, I, I I've opened up your predictions um, just so I can like judge you very very thoroughly, um, and you are going out on some limbs for for Emmy night, but at the same time I can't I can't fault you for that because Mr. Seventy Five Percent I should or Seventy Two Percent I should follow you off some of these cliffs. So um, the first one I have to ask you about is. Uh, you are going with, and this is kind of an open category, so I can see where this could happen, where this could be one of those categories where we think it's going to be one of three people mm -hmm. and it ends up being this number six person who we were like, where did that come from? You're predicting Letitia Wright to win Best Movie Miniseries Supporting Actress for Black Mirror, the episode uh, Black Museum. Uh, so what got you there over the two women from Versace and uh, Merritt Weaver for Godless who seem like kind of on paper yeah, uh, the strongest possibilities. You know, especially with this category, there's always been a few upsets the last couple of years, you know, with Regina King's surprise wins, Kathy Bates a couple of years ago. Um, so this category in particular is always prime for us. And I mean, if you write like a cat woman, uh, or hurdle just to get them out of it. You know, might not have the name recognition and prestige of a Penelope Cruz or a Judith Light, but she was in one of the biggest films of the year. Um, people loved her character in Black Panther. Um, they love her as an actress. And, um, you know, Black Mirror is still like one of the more popular anthology series too, um, hence their Emmy win. So I think she's probably gonna pull it out. Um, I'm hoping so I can be right, but if there's a surprise, I think it might be her come Emmy night. I'd kind of love to see that. I feel like she'd be the kind of winner who, like I doubt would be expecting it. You know, it's, yeah. you know, you know, if she's paying attention to our odds, she definitely wouldn't be expecting it because, uh, <laughs> and she's the only representative, uh, you know, Black Mirror got a lot of support, but mostly for USS Callister. She's the only representative for a Black Museum. Um, so it would be a really, really big deal for her to win. And I would love to see that acceptance speech. I feel like she would just be delightful on stage. Um, now, among other, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say this is as shaky a limb because, uh, you know, we do have a lot of experts predicting her. I believe she's ranked second in our overall odds for Best Drama Actress. Uh, that's Sandra Oh, you are predicting, will win for Killing Eve. And I think you believe uh, that she's going to do that because of partly that, uh, the social significance of it. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about more of uh, of her nomination and why you think uh, she could win for that. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of multiple things for her. Um, you know, first and first off, I mean, it's just her talent and, you know, um, just the great performance that she pulled off in Killing Eve. Um, and then also with her being a past nominee, five-time nominee for Grey's Anatomy, I think that's the overdue factor um, with uh, voters um, in terms of honoring her 
her well-deserved and long overdue Emmy. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, um, just the cultural significance, you know, with her being an Asian um, actor, performer, uh, this will be a great opportunity for the Emmys to honor, you know, an underrepresented group that now with films like Crazy Rich Asians and, you know, various actors like Sandra Oh and Constance Wu um, being in the forefront, you know, of representing the Asian community, um, I think it will be a great opportunity to um, embrace them. And, you know, she'll be the perfect person to become the first Asian actress to win in that category. Yeah. And, uh, and that's interesting. I do think um, it, it's hard to look at that race and, and, and know which way to go because with, uh, with Best Drama Actress, you could look at it and see like, okay, The Handmaid's Tale has a lot of support. So, you know, it's up for Best Drama Series. So Elizabeth Moss might win or, you know, Claire Foy and Carrie Russell are also in Best Drama Series nominees. Evan Rachel Wood is in a Best Drama Series nominee. Why would it be uh, Sandra Oh? And then I can't help but look just two years ago, Tatiana Maslany won this and she's nominated again. Uh, she won this on her show's only nomination. She's her show's only nomination again. There's a certain passionate factor mm -hmm. um, that you don't necessarily have to be uh, the most popular show if you, if you really stand out with the right voters um, or with enough of the right voters to, to really kind of push you through that passionate vote. You know, it could be an interesting situation where The Handmaid's Tale wins best drama series, but The Handmaid doesn't win Best Actress, um, which would be a, a, at least not that handmade. Um, we, 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 we could potentially see Alexa Bledel, she would be another handmade, um, be, be the only other handmade who could win, um, yeah, because the other two supporting actresses are not handmaids per se. Um, so, um, so, you know, but you're not predicting uh, Handmaid's Tale for Best Drama Series, which is our current front runner for Best Drama Series overall at Gold Derby. You are predicting Game of Thrones, and I think there is a very good reason to believe that Game of Thrones could come back and win. Uh, it won the last time it was eligible in 2016. So both it and Handmaid's Tale are defending champions. They've never gone head to head here before uh, now. Uh, so, so what makes you think it's going to be Game of Thrones over Handmaid's Tale? Yeah, you know, that's one of those predictions that I go back and forth, you know, every other day. You know, every day I'm checking, like, mm, I'm going to go with Handmaid's Tale today, and the next day it's Game of Thrones. So it could very well change before um, Emmy night. But I'm thinking, like, with Game of Thrones, I mean, it's just been one of those shows that's been able to sustain its buzz since the first season. Um, you know, it's just one of those shows that's just talked about, water cooler buzz. Um and um, I just think that it just appeals to so many different people within the TV Academy branch from performers and writers and directors and, you know, the behind the scenes um, and below the lines um, individuals that um, I think they might pull it off. I mean, Handmaid's Tale also had a great second season. Um, I see it repeating, but, um, you know, with the Emmys, especially now with the new voting system, repeat winners seem like that's a thing of the past. Um, in terms of the new Emmy voting structure now. Yeah, it, it, it's, I keep going back and forth on this. I've got The Handmaid's Tale at the moment, but I could make a case either way. Um, the Handmaid's Tale exploded in nominations in season two. I think it had 12 or 13 last year. It has 20 this year. Um, but at the same time, and it's not eligible for consideration, but I'm sure voters who saw it will be thinking about it, uh, is the last two or three episodes of the season aired too late even to qualify under the hanging episodes rule. Uh, so it's only the first 10 episodes of the uh, 12 or 13 episode season that are actually nominated here. Um, and those last few episodes weren't universally loved. Um, they were a little divisive. Um, and so by the time voting for the winners was taking place, people would have had that last impression of the show. Um, whereas, and it's an interesting situation because you've got both Handmaid's Tale and Game of Thrones are both based on books, but they've both now gone beyond the books. At this yep. Um, and I feel like Handmaid's Tale got a little bit more flack for that in season two than Game of Thrones did. Uh, Game of Thrones, I feel like there was a lot more general satisfaction with the direction of the storyline, even though it aired like a year ago. Yep. Um, so it's really hard to tell. It's like, you know, Game of Thrones won seven at Creative Arts. That's almost as much as it won the last couple of times it was there. So it didn't really lose any ground. Handmaid's Tale won three at Creative Arts, which was the same amount it won last year before it went on to sweep at the top categories. So like, 
creative arts didn't help me at all there. Uh, <laughs> uh, were you on Game of Thrones before creative arts, or, or did you change after creative arts, or is this something that you just kind of stuck with? Uh, something I kind of stuck with. You know, I just knew it was going to be between Game of Thrones and Handmaid's Tale, with um, The Crown being a potential spoiler. Um, you know, I just, to your point, I think with just the buzz of Game of Thrones and then just the anticipation of the uh, final season, um, you know, I think voters are probably just eager to, to reward it and then anticipating the final season as well. So, uh, one, one thing I will hold you two is that you just said uh, repeat winners are a thing of the past, but you are predicting Donald Glover will win again. You are predicting Sterling K. Brown will win again for best actor in a comedy, best actor in a drama. Uh, defend yourself, uh, you hypocrite. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm last. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't want to give the Emmys too much credit now. You know, let's be fair. Uh, sometimes they do like to, you know, honor previous winners. Um, but I feel like with Donald Glover, um, you know, it's a combination of um, just a beloved show that did really well second season in terms of the nominations. I mean, Donald Glover is just like the renaissance man of the Hollywood industry right now. Um, and um, I just think for him, it's a no-brainer for him to repeat. Um, Sterling K. Brown, I feel like has a bit more competition, um, you know, with the second season of This Is Us, his character wasn't um, like the breakthrough star um, as he was in the first season. Um, but I think with just um, his respect in the industry, um, he also received an additional acting nomination for Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, I just think he's gonna be one of those performers come Emmy night that will repeat um, along with Donald Glover and a few others. Yeah, I, I, I might switch back. I've been predicting Matthew Reese since the nominations were announced just because I was thinking, okay, Milo couldn't beat Sterling in year one. I mean, that was the year of Sterling. That was, there was no way that was gonna happen. This year, it, was, it felt like on This Is Us, the year of Milo. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it could be, you know, does that mean Milo wins or does that mean that Milo takes just enough of votes away from Sterling for someone else to win? Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I've been predicting Matthew Reese. But the more and more I think about it, the more I wonder if I'm just willing that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I might switch back to Sterling K. Brown. It reminds me a little bit of the year uh, at the Oscars with uh, Denzel Washington and Fences and Casey Affleck in Manchester by the Sea. And I kept clinging to, you know, the SAG Award. Denzel won SAG. Yep. And he's going to. And then, like in the last weekend before the Oscars, I thought, look at everything else. Everything else is telling you, Casey Affleck, don't like, don't be married to this one thing to justify predicting the person you want to win. And I have a feeling at this point that I'm clinging to vote splitting in that same way to justify uh, Matthew Reese prediction. And it could still happen. I still would like it to happen. I hope it, I hope it does happen. I love Sterling. I won't, I honestly wouldn't be mad for him to have another Emmy. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, so so I might I might switch back to Sterling because it, it could be a situation like and Ron Cephas Jones showed us that you know with two I mean Ron Cephas Jones showed us that Milo could win um, just because you know if they're this is us fans they won't necessarily just name check the same person they liked last year they might look at the year and say like oh this person had a really good year uh, this person hasn't won yet let's give it to this person um, so I might you know and they could split votes and still go like one and two potentially. Yeah, uh, you know, that, that happened a lot in our uh, Gold Derby Awards uh, with our point total. Some people split the votes and lost out. Some people split the votes and were still at the top. So, um, yeah, I think I, I think you, actually me, I think I convinced myself to switch back to Sterling. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, w while I'm wrestling with that, let's, uh, let's talk about comedy series where it's another one where we disagree, but I can also, again, make a case either way. I've been predicting Marvelous Mrs. Maisel for a while. You're predicting Atlanta. I'm not. I don't think you're crazy. Certainly, that could absolutely happen. What What is it about Atlanta that makes you uh, predict that over me? You know, I think with Atlanta, um, you know, there was high expectations for its sophomore season, and you know, normally with shows, once they have a successful first season, oftentimes the second season isn't the best or doesn't live up to expectations. But Atlanta 
blew away my expectations and obviously a lot of the Emmy voters in terms of the amount of nominations they've received. Um, you know, I just, I think, um, you know, the marvelous Miss May, Mrs. Maisel, um, the strong contender for foil. I mean, you know, just out the gate, winning big awards at the Golden Globes, Critics' Choice, so on and so forth. Um, I just feel like Atlanta is the show to be. You know, I think with Donald Glover, star, the star of the Prize, you know, with the movies and music, um, I think that the Emmys are going to embrace Atlanta with a big win. I, I will say, in in uh, I will make that case for Atlanta that the, I think it's sixteen nominations are a bigger deal than uh, Mrs. Maisel's fourteen nominations. Mm -hmm. um, I you, you, they're they're both like more or less equal in terms of the amount of nominations. But you know, you look at a show like Maisel, which is a period series with a lot of costumes and sets and 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 you know a lot of flashbacks, so editing. Um, so that was a show that's not surprising that did as well as it did below the line. The fact that Atlanta, which is a kind of a smaller scale show, it doesn't, it's not as showy in terms of its, uh, of, of its technical uh, elements. Um, it, it pulled in 16, um, it exploded in those acting categories. It didn't, you know, I think most of us thought Brian Tyree Henry was gonna get in this time around, but it wasn't just him. It was also Zazie Beetz and, uh, and Cat Williams who won, we talked about. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not going to talk myself quite into this because I still do think Atlanta is too out there in terms of the kind of show, like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel feels like, not to be cynical, but like it feels more comfortable. Like it feels like a show that Emmy voters like can, re would recognize compared to some shows they voted before. Like it feels more like a modern family or a, or an Ally McBeal, or, or even an Everybody Loves Marie. It feels like more like everything they've ever voted. But Atlanta feels like nothing they've ever voted for before, <laughs> um, which is actually helps it too, because it's it's it completely you know in a category with eight nominees, like you only need a, a fairly small percentage theoretically to win. So if it's that popular with that small percentage, it could still win. Um, keep arguing against myself in these, in these I, could, I could host the slugfest alone and just be like back and forth like Gollum. I know. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about one or two more categories that yeah. your uh, your predictions are are not necessarily with the mainstream. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just scrolling through the list to find out what I'm judging you on. And <laughs> let's, let's start with comedy supporting actually, because you have uh, the two would be surprises. Um, yeah, Lori Metcalf for uh, Roseanne for Comedy Supporting Actress and Brian Tyree Henry for Atlanta. Brian Tyree Henry totally makes sense if you think, you know, uh, Cat Williams, you know, was a kind of a, a, a harbinger of what's to come for the actors. Um, and if the show is going to win Best Comedy Series, you could easily see it kind of sweeping along some other people. Um, you yeah, know, so, so what was your thinking behind Lori Metcalf and, and Brian Tyree? Hmm. Well, in terms of Lori Metcalf, um, I think for her, um, she's a respected actress, um, previous Emmy winner actually for her role on Roseanne. Um, she recently just um, was nominated for her first Oscar. Um, she won um, in a surprising victory at the Tony Awards. Um, you know, I just feel with that category and with it being eight nominees, you know, I think she might be the one that people might gravitate towards just because of the year she's had. And also with the whole Roseanne <laughs> debacle that they might want to give her a pat on the back for doing this. So, <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, just her being a veteran in the industry, I think they're probably going to give it to her. Um, in terms of comedy support actor, I've had Brian Tyree Henry for a while, but I think I might switch him out with Henry Winkler. Um, and my reasoning is just with the whole makeup award scenario, you know, Henry Winkler is also a TV icon. Um, he's been nominated in the past and I believe he hasn't won an Emmy. Right? Uh, he hasn't won primetime. He has he has a couple of daytime Emmys, but if you ask our fellow editor, Chris Beach, on that bear, that doesn't even count. <laughs> <laughs> I count it, but he, yeah, he's never won a primetime Emmy. He's he's been famous for his work in primetime, obviously from Happy Days, um, but he's never won a primetime Emmy. So yeah, this would be a, a huge, huge. 
Yeah, and you know, I'm leaning towards switching my predictions and going with Henry based on that. And I mean, you look at someone like Louis Anderson, who's been in the industry for a while and then, you know, with his role in baskets and winning um, in this category. Um, I think that the Emmy voters might want to give him, you know, his just due and then also honor Barry too, you know, since he's nominated for several awards and is up by uh, some stiff competition in several of those categories. Yeah, that's and that's the I think even more than the overdue factor, like I really feel like the idea that if if you are an Emmy voter and you like Barry, this is a place you can go. Yep. Because it, it feels, you know, it feels like Maisel or Atlanta are going to one or both of those are gonna take the comedy writing and directing. Uh one of them is gonna take comedy series. Um uh Bill Hader, I think, is the closest to Donald Glover for comedy actor, but it doesn't feel that close. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you're really looking at Barry and you want to pat it on the back, then it's it's really uh, Henry Winkler who you can go to. Um, so, so I really think you know it's almost you know to, to make another odd uh, parallel to the Oscars. It's it's like that that's your Tilda Swinton and Michael Clayton. Yeah. It's like that's that's the one place you can go and a re reward that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a place where you can reward this show. Uh, so, so I, I think it's going to be. Uh, Winkler too. I think Metcalf could win. I think if they retroactively renamed that nomination so that she's nominated for the Connors, um, <laughs> like the idea of giving an Emmy to Roseanne, uh, I think still might feel a little bit uncomfortable for some voters. Yeah. But the idea of giving it to Laurie Metcalf to stick it to Roseanne in a certain kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of like using your Emmy ballot to subtweet Roseanne, basically. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It, it, you know, it, it, I think that could appeal to them too. Um, you know, so, so, okay, I, I'm not gonna say she's out of it. I'm predicting Borstein uh, for, for Marvelous Mrs. Maisel there. Um, but, but yeah, that's a, that's a category that could go a few different ways. And I, I think that's one of those categories where kind of like movie mini supporting actress, you think it's a little divided, so it could be a completely out of nowhere surprise. Mm -hmm. This is a similar one where, like looking at this list of another, again, a category with eight nominees, so it doesn't take as many votes to put you over the top. Um, I, like a Betty Gilpin could come out of nowhere. Um, you know, a, a, a Zazie Beetz could, could you know, if, if Atlanta goes on that kind of run, maybe she she goes along for the ride. Uh, you know, Megan Mullally, she's also won before. You know, they didn't really like Will and Grace that much, but now that she got in, um, like maybe she has enough support to, to get her that, 12, 13, 14% of the vote that she would need. Um, so, so yeah, this, this could be um, um, really, really uh, interesting. Uh, well, before we close out, I'd like to ask you, uh, regardless of what you're predicting will happen on any night, what is something that you most want to happen in terms of uh, the winners? Um, let's see, looking through all of my predictions, um, I actually would love Sandra O oh to win drama actress you know um i think like i mentioned before she's long overdue for an emmy um i think it's a long time coming for emmys for the emmys to start honoring people of color especially in the lead category i mean just a few years ago viola davis is the first black actress to win in that category so i think it would just be great just to start opening the door and honoring you know people of color um, so that way it gets to the point where it's no more about, oh, they're the first Asian, the first Hispanic, the first Black, and it's just like, they're the best actor or actress. So I'm hoping she's able to, you know, pull the win and break that glass ceiling. Uh, well, with that, um, thank you, Cordell, for, so much for, for discussing your Emmy predictions with us and um, uh, showing us all up at the Creative Arts Awards over the weekend. Uh, it, it, it was an honor to be bested by you, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Cordell, and thank you everyone for watching. We will uh, certainly see uh, more of you and you will see more of us if you so choose uh, as uh, the Emmys approach and uh, further down the line with uh, uh, other awards this year. Uh, thank you very much.